Everybody all set? If you just came in, we have a sign-up sheet coming around. If you want to sign that, that'd be awesome. So, all right. So the current version of Juju is Juju 1.25. That's our stable release. And we are currently working on Juju 2.0, which is going to be released in April. Um, if you're the kind of person that comes to a config management camp, therefore we figured you guys are generally smart people. Uh, so we wanted to set you up for success with 2.0, which is coming out in the next month or two. So we'll be showing you how to install the latest alpha and beta. And the next alpha gets released literally tomorrow. Um, and because we did some changes there, some of the things we've learned over the past few years, we're doing things like changing some of the commands and stuff. We figured if you've never used Juju before, we'll get you started uh, with a 2.0. Um, so you don't have to go through like an upgrade process in your mind of what changed and things like that. Um, however, with that, we need to talk about terminology first. Um, you notice Mark was very specific in the words he used this morning when talking about models and controllers and applications. So um, Marco's going to take some time to kind of explain what we mean when we say a model or an application to kind of help us all understand as a group together what the base vocabulary of the language is. So with that, Marco's going to start with what exactly Juju is. Uh, so since the majority of you were all at the keynote this morning, I imagine you at least have some concept form in your mind of what Juju is. Um, and so what Juju really strives to do is what we call application modeling. And as Mark eloquently explained during the keynote, uh, it's the idea that I should be able to describe how I deploy an application, how I scale that application, how the application consumes resources, and how those applications connect with each other. And the modeling portion of this is really more of the how does that manage at a higher level. So what Juju really is, is Juju's here. Give me your controller. Oh, sure. This is my favorite presenting device. Um, so Juju's application modeling. Mark showed you all while on stage, but what Juju's great is it also models against almost any cloud you can imagine. So bare metal is a cloud. Uh, this is just like one of the orange boxes Mark had. I kind of took it apart if you don't want to poke at it, but it's just a rack. It's just a data center. It's bare metal. A lot of people still run bare metal. A lot of people still have data centers. It's still a thing that maybe people are into. But it's also the cloud. The cloud is also fantastic. Uh, so Juju works against a myriad of cloud providers. So if you're using a cloud provider today, odds are Juju supports it. For example, Google Compute Engine, Azure, Joyent, Amazon Web Services, uh, Rackspace. Uh, I could probably keep going on, but I should probably shouldn't. Mm -hmm. So if I have a data cloud, come talk to us afterwards. We can see if, if it does work against your cloud. But what really is, is Juju at the end of the day really can just work against any machine you have SSH access to. Mm -hmm. um, so Juju works across any mm -hmm. kind of infrastructure you may be able to already have or that you wish to model. Um, and Juju really wants to model. That's what Juju loves to do. And by Juju modeling things, it makes it easier for everyone to consume <coughs> these components. By abstracting away what it means to have infrastructure and applications and relations, it makes it very easy to port that model against any cloud. So once we figured out how to, how to model applications on Amazon, we abstract away what that means. Really what Amazon is is a set of machines, a set of disks, a set of networks, uh, and a set of primitives and those primitives pretty much apply to every single cloud you can imagine today. All that stuff is, is transported. So by Juju modeling what that looks like at an abstract language, where you have machines, you have storage, you have network, it makes it really easy to say that my application needs a machine, it needs a network, and it needs a storage, and Juju translate that, is that translation layer, to that actual execution. How do I get these from the thing I positioned it against? So Juju models these things. And Juju models, oh well, Networking, storage, and machines, that's the important infrastructure part. And then Juju models applications using charms. Mark talked briefly about what charms are, but charms are really the important thing about Juju. Juju is just an implementation detail. It's how we do modeling. Anything could really go through and write the abstraction layer for modeling, and a lot of configuration management tools are doing that today. They're starting to grow that language of how do I model past just the machine. But what makes Juju really invaluable is how it does the modeling of applications, and that is by a charm. Um, cute names aside, a charm is actually a really powerful component to Juju that describes what it means to be an application. And really what it is, is it's, it's tying that abstraction layer between what the model is and what I need to do in order to respond to the model. How do I consume storage? How do I get the resources that Juju or any modeling tool is allocated? The charm does that, and the charm is basically code that, that embodies that. And because it's just a generic abstraction of these resources, it can be in any language. The important thing here is that charms are just code. And by just being code, it could be Python, it could be Ruby, 
it could be bash, but it could also be leveraging existing configuration management uh, primitives. It could be Puppet, it could be Ansible, as we'll show later on this week. Um, it could be anything you're currently using. Charms become that translation layer to, I know how to define what my machine looks like. Configuration management tools have done a fantastic job of defining and providing a structure for setting up a machine. What modeling does in this, in this layer is, how does that machine work with the rest of my view of the world? And so, by experts being able to say is, you know, I spent the last 10 years learning Puppet, I know how to set up this service in Puppet, I do it really well. But having someone else say, I know how to set up this component, completely orthogonal to that one, but I've done it in Chef, and I've done it really well. And they're the experts in that, and they just happen to choose a tool. Juju tries to take that tool and say, let's let them work together. So by modeling at a higher level than a configuration management tool or a language, you get the ability to start tying these components together. And they all just start speaking the model. Um, so that's what Juju charms are. And then Juju just becomes that model event server. It just starts pushing events out. You need to do these things. The charms translates those events to whatever language, tooling, or primitive that you want to use. Um, so that's, that's kind of a high level. That's a lot of what Mark said kind of condensed down to more actionable items. So during this week in this track, we'll be looking at what charms are, starting the next talk, and then really rolling into what do charms look like when they implement these different primitives? How does it look when it's written in Python? What does it look like written with Ansible? Um, and how can I leverage the expertise that you all already have in deploying the services you're already managing? Or how do I consume the expertise of other people who've already deployed and managed these? And get that goodness, that expertise, that hard to gain master knowledge into my environment. Um, so that's the majority of what Juju is at a high level. George's gonna take you through now kind of the nitty gritty of how do you get it installed? How do we get started today? Yeah, um, any questions before we move oh, on? Yeah. Because I feel like this is like, <laughs> Before you get to installing, you should kind of understand what you're getting yourself into. Yeah. Competition. What about competition? Is there any competition, you think? For Juju? Um, probably. I mean, there are a bunch of tools that are coming out now. There are tools that have existed before. Um, I gave a similar talk at Fostum over the weekend. Someone pointed me to a couple of new tools that are that are I was aware of. One, Cloudify, which is a toxic compliant um, orchestration tool. Another one that just came out from Walmart called OneOps. Um, so I've been playing around and looking at these tools. Um, they all kind of start speaking that same language or are starting to learn that language of modeling. The problems that I see with these um, is that they become very language specific. It's very hard to solve an abstract problem when you're growing from the ground up. When you're saying, well, I have this expertise in Ruby, OneOps being a Ruby tool. So we took all the expertise and we wrote a DSL for this that we can now do really easy modeling if you know the DSL. And Puppet's growing this kind of language as well with their latest release of Puppet Enterprise, but it all needs to be in that Puppet silo. So if you're a Puppet expert, that's fantastic for you. But that language, that knowledge is still siloed to that language. We don't see many tools that have this kind of abstraction layer. When we wrote Juju, we wrote it with the idea that we don't care about the configuration management, as Mark so lightly <laughs> put in his talk. What we really care about is modeling, and how do we tie these components together, and how do we leverage the expertise where it is. So I'm not aware of any competing tools, there are tools that are achieving similar language, which is fantastic for us because we really think modeling is the future of how you do these things. But I haven't found a tool yet that's really comparable to what Juju is trying to do as far as that agnostic language constructive modeling. Have you looked at Mantle? Of Mantle? Cisco, Mantle of Cisco and uh, Cisco Ship? I haven't. Is it an open source tool? Uh, Mantle is and Cisco Ship will be. I'll take a look and I'll, if you find me later, I'll be happy to talk about it. But I haven't, I'm not aware of that one. I'm learning new ones all the time. so. Um, I'd be happy to look at that one, yeah. Great question. The really um, cool thing is that a lot of folks like Puppet and folks are talking more about modeling, you know, which I think is great for, for the DevOps community in general. In general. It really is that kind of next step yeah. in the architecture. Yeah. Um, yes? What does the shells can cover dependencies? How do you manage dependencies? That's a fantastic question. Um, so that's one of the hard things that we've hit in previous versions of Juju. If you've been using Juju before, you're probably saying, well, yeah, I, the charm code just says install these dependencies from somewhere, but that's not very reliable. Um, in Juju 2.0, we're adding an explicit construct to the model called resources, where charm declares, I need these components, and they can be provided from an upstream source, they can be provided from our charm store, or from the user directly. So we manage dependencies by saying, you define and declare everything you need. So if you want to go to an offline environment where you can't get public egress access, you can do so. Um, so Juju has a new construct in this model for resources, charms, declare resources and consume them. Um, and that's how we've been 
managing the dependency train now. Um, but generally speaking, charms are just code that runs as root on a machine. So if you need to, if you feel the urge to wget and pipe the shell, you can do so as one way to fetch dependencies. Um, there are more eloquent solutions that have been coming up. Most charms use a packaging format, say RPMs for CentOS machines or Chocolatey on Windows or Act on Debian and Ubuntu machines. Um, but it's really up to the author and how they best see that, that the expert way to install this. And a lot of them are using existing primitives for packaging and dependency management. Like if, if I would like to put a packet code inside the charm, how would I install a packet code? Do I need to call it a shell script to install a packet before I need a packet code? Ah, that's a fantastic question. Um, in short, yes, you have to, I mean, mostly you're installing puppets so you can run puppet apply with, you know, the translation of data that Juju gives you into facts so that you can leverage those. Um, but my next talk is going to show how you don't have to reconstruct that every time. Um, so we have a way to manage the logic needed to install even those baseline components inside of a charm and abstract that away from you even. So we can say, here's, here you say, I need to pop it on the machine and Juju will get that onto you there for you and then you can build on top of that. But that's a fantastic question as well. Thanks. Um, but you should stick around in the next 20 minutes and we'll show you how that's possible. Uh, any other questions uh, before we get to a few more of the logistic -y things? We have some time, so please feel free to ask them. Uh, if something sounds weird or off to you, just raise your hand at any time. It's a pretty informal talk driven by the questions you all have. Mark has a question. I wanna, oh. I wanna, well, I wanna weigh in on something Marco just said as a kind of clue to that, that next presentation. When we started out, we thought that the unit of collaboration would be the charm. Right? That you'd have all the people who were interested in like the world's best deployment of Hadoop would collaborate around the charm for Hadoop. And all the people interested in the world's best deployment of Kubernetes would collaborate around the Kubernetes charms. What we've realized is that actually inside of charms, you've got the amalgamation of best practice which spans multiple charms. We first noticed that when we realized that say you've got, you want to write 10 different charms that all talk to a database. The way we originally sort of envisaged it, it was really cool because those charms can be written in completely different languages. The challenge, of course, is that they have to implement the same sort of messaging conventions so that they can agree on stuff. And what we realized is it would be much faster if actually the person that wrote the first one of those wrote both halves in a way that that could be reused across the other nine charms that we're going to talk to this. And so if you imagine that thing as being a charm that's going to stand up a Java stack and do a bunch of things and talk to this database, if you can essentially cargo cult in a professional way that's structured and systematic, the common the capabilities, right? In your case, how do I get Puppet stood up so that I can go use Puppet? But typically also, how do I get Docker stood up? Or how do I get Rails? Or how do I get um, uh, Java stood up effectively? That problem, that operational problem, is common to many, many, many charms. And so there's a sort of new unit of collaboration that's emerged, which is the layer. And so that's all I'll say about that. Great question. Yes? Um, I was going to ask for a moment, but as you're in, that's all to ask. Um, charms go to charms store, and they get signed off by you guys. Do you have a mechanism for retiring charms that are either redundant or been too significant? Because if you go into the charm store, you see multiple charms doing the same or similar things. Right. Which one do you pick? Right, so we do have, um, there is a hub for these charms. It's called our charm store. It's where we have uh, many um, ISVs and partners publish, as well as community members publish these things into the charm store. Uh, so the question is, how do you know which of the charms to, to publish, uh, to use? And so we have a review process where we have a, we call an approved namespace of things that are vetted and approved by myself or another charmer in the community. Um, we also have a personal namespace. So there is a, in order, if you wanted to share what you've worked on or if you forked the charm and want to iterate on it and out of band of that approved reviewed namespace, you can publish there. So oftentimes when you search, the first one you'll find is the approved one. It's denoted by being owned by, a, by charmers. And then you'll see several others that are typically owned by user names, and that's in their personal namespace there. So when you're searching for charms, you always want to find the approved one if it's there, um, and use that one and consume that one in your infrastructure. Um, so that's what I would say for how to find which one we want. And we're also, with Juju 2.0, we're kind of revamping our, our store experience and how you do searches and the results we give you back. So if you're getting too much at once, we'd love to talk with you a bit more about your user experience with the store. Um, but you should always be looking for that kind of approved 
recommended. general stamp of approval uh, charm. The recommended, I'm sorry, yes, the recommended charm. Um, but great question, yes, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Awesome, great. Well, I'm gonna hand it back to George to get back to how do you get started with Juju? How do you get installing it? How do you get rolling with it? Okay, before we get started, I wanna give you guys a list of places that you wanna bookmark and uh, kind of reference like while you're waiting for things to install and things of that nature. So the first one is the root, the jujucharms.com. This is the root domain that has our store. It has a demo um, site on it, so demo.jujucharms.com. These are all obvious when you go there. That kind of gives you that canvas that you guys saw during the keynote that you can play around with mock deployments of, of separate bundles and things like that. Um, so everything that we do is linked from this site here. Um, the big one that you're gonna care about if you're gonna be here for the next uh, few days are the documentation links. Um, so when you go to jujucharms.com slash docs, you'll see the release version of our docs. And as I mentioned earlier, that's for the stable version of Ubuntu. I'm sorry, of Juju. Um, but in the version box right there on the docs page, there's a little link that says devil, which will take you here. And that kind of gives you the instructions for the new ways, the new terminology, the new commands that we're, do that we're using now. So if it's your first time, I just recommend that you start there. Um, and we'll all go through the next few days of, of using, referring to this documentation as a way to get started and, and things like that. Um, so first things first, installing Juju. Show of hands, how many of you guys deploying on Windows machines? The clients, have, okay, so we, we do publish a Windows executable for Juju as well that you can download from jujucharms.com um, and you'll get uh, the same experience. We also have a Mac uh, OS 10 version in Brew as well, so you can Brew install Juju. When you go to jujucharms.com, we kind of give we ask you what OS you want, and you can get the instructions that you want. But I'm going to walk through the uh, the Ubuntu instructions here. Just out of curiosity, how many of you are deploying on CentOS? Installing or deploying? Or cl cl clients? I'm sorry. Let's start over. Who's clients. got a Fedora desktop? Who's got like a Fedora desktop or CentOS? Cool. Okay. Debian and Ubuntu. Okay. Any other Linux? Okay. So when you click through, you'll find the tarball um, in Launchpad. Uh, if, if you're uh, a developer for a distribution and you're interested in getting your client into your distribution, we'd love to work with you on that. So let's just go over the Ubuntu instructions real quick. Um, first thing you need to do is add a PPA. In this case, we're adding the Juju development PPA. Normally that slash devil is actually slash stable. Uh, but like, like as we said, we wanted to get you guys on the latest, greatest stuff. So um, you add a PPA there. How many of you not familiar with adding a PPA? You guys are DevOps people, good. Um, and as always, you have to do an update after that. And then just installing the Juju package will get you everything that you need to get started um, using Juju. If you're on Ubuntu 14.04 and you wanna do LexD, which is deploying on your laptop, then you, we'll have to see Marco get you squared away with some little uh, tidbit. So if you're still on 14.04 or that sort of thing, we're currently in the process of revamping our Vagrant boxes, which come with Juju already built in. So you'll just get a Vagrant box, you'll Vagrant up your Vagrant SSH, and you'll get all of this uh, inside of VM. Then you have that Juju init. What this does is create an, uh, a skeleton environments.yaml and a .juju directory in your home directory. This is all going away. Um, so Rick is gonna kinda cover this. So this is enough to get you started, but in the upcoming version of Juju 2.0, we'll be smarter about Take, uh, getting your cloud credentials and importing them um, into Juju, which I will cover here in a little bit. But for now, you're gonna have to edit the environments.yaml. It's self-documented in there. So we have little uh, boilerplate sections for AWS, for Google Cloud Engine, uh, for Azure, whatever cloud credentials that you have, you can just uncomment those sections and follow the instructions. Save the file and then you'll be good to go. Also in there, you'll find um, a uh, commented out snippet for getting the LexD provider working, which is what we recommend if you want to run it on a laptop and you don't want to spend money in a car. <coughs> so um, pretty much uh, very straightforward there. Of all those clouds that you define, you can switch it between those, what we used to call environments, now we call them models. So with the Juju switch command, you can say, okay, I want to switch between AWS and Azure. You can have as many of those as you want, production, development, staging, that sort of thing. Um, so you'll, you'll go and you'll, you'll it's, it's pretty straightforward, no problems there. And then you'll type the Juju Bootstrap command. So Juju Bootstrap is what fires up a controller. 
And the controller is the piece that will host all your models for you. Uh, that takes a few minutes. Effectively, what's happening there when you type that, whatever cloud you're in, Juju says, I need an instance. The cloud provides it to it. Installs the operating system, does a quick up, update, upgrade, installs um, Juju itself, the controller, and then that node will effectively handle all the modeling uh, for you there. And for those of you that have been using Juju in the past, when using this in HA mode, this is the thing that you want to be running uh, with Ensure HA, and then always make sure you have an odd number of controllers available for HA configuration. For those of you wondering whether we're HA capable or not. Um, next thing, so after the bootstrap will happen, that, that'll take a little bit, usually on Amazon, I don't know, five to seven minutes, something like that. Uh, you'll type Juju tab, and then just hit tab on your keyboard, and it'll show you a list of all the commands. Um, and we'll be covering a bunch of those. I'm gonna give you kind of the cheat sheet version of the commands that I use most of the time, and then over the next few days, we'll kind of talk about uh, you know, how to add different parameters to these and do more complex things. Um, the command juju help commands will just show you all of the commands and you can always say juju help and then any of the commands that were listed there. So you can say juju help deploy and it will tell you all, all the features of the deploy command, for example. Then at this point, one thing I like to do is I open a new terminal and I type watch juju status. Juju status kind of shows you everything that you need everything that's happening in your current model. That will show you machines, what applications you've deployed, where, IP addresses, state of the workload, state of Juju itself, state of the agents, whatnot. I, like, I prefer to have that open as a separate terminal so that I can do things and then kind of keep an eye on what's happening there. It's a good visual um, uh, indicator of what's happening. Uh, and then of course you want to deploy something, right? So usually we pick, <laughs> Uh, a charm here or a bundle. I have a bundle that's called Media Wiki, Media Wiki Scalable that will give you a bunch of Media Wikis, an HA proxy balancer, then a database and a few slaves. And that allows you to kind of play around with horizontally scaling one layer or the other. And then, so for those of you who don't know what a bundle is, just briefly, right. um, charms are that single component that describes how the application is deployed and scaled. A bundle is essentially the YAML representation of a model. So you've ever seen any of the, the UI stuff from earlier in the keynote, all that stuff can be explained and described as a YAML file, which is the YAML representation again of that model that you can just feed to Juju and Juju will rectify that model against whatever cloud you've chosen. So in this case, MediaWiki Scalable is a model that says I have MySQL scaled and MediaWiki scaled and a load balancer in front of it. Um, so instead of having to type all of those components directly into Juju, you can just feed it that representation. And as we'll show you later, you can also use the GUI itself to kind of just browse, pick the icons of the things that you want and put it together in a graphical manner. We support aliasing of things, so this is Juju Deploy, charm name, and then whatever you want to name it. Um, that's kind of important. When I first started using Juju, I was like, oh, this is really neat. I could deploy MySQL over and over and over and again, and then I realized I had like MySQL 1 and MySQL 2. So then I started naming them to be more descriptive things like, you know, blog database, things of like that. That sort of. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're de when you're deploying things and when you see these bundles. Adding relations is really what Juju does. Like to me, that's like the one thing that it like it was invented for, right? So in the old days when you did this, this is the equivalent of okay, I've set up my SQL. Now I have to tell you would go into WordPress, right, and tell it what the IP address of the database was, right? Then you hit next. Then the database had to go create some tables. Then you would have to come back to WordPress, right, and, and do click finish install and it would clean up things. And then you had a working block, right? These are the things that Juju automates the best, right? So we'll go into what that looks like as far as defining a relationship between two services. Uh, but this is the command that does that. And then adding unit, remove unit is how we do horizontal scalability. And we'll get into that later. But the really nice thing about modeling things at the, at the application level is we kind of get horizontal scaling for free, right? If, if the database knows what to do every time MediaWiki needs to talk to it, right? Then really all we're doing is incrementing a number and then we, don't, we, we get that horizontal scalability. Um, destroy model has, so when you go juju destroy hit tab, um, it will show you all the related terms. So this is when you're like, okay, I'm kind of done with this. I want to clean up and start over. This is what you use. 
destroys, has like destroy units, um, destroying services and whatnot. So that's basically each one of these commands has a destroy equivalent for you to clean up the model. Um, and then my favorite command, sometimes you see a little bit too much. Oh, I'm sorry. Just go back. So one thing that may not be immediately obvious is that the work that happens to relate MySQL and WordPress in that example doesn't necessarily happen just when you establish the relation. For example, say you've got, um, say your database actually needs to be related to something else before it can be available as a database, right? That, that combination of where is the database, but also is the database ready for me? That's modeled as the state of the MySQL service and the state of the WordPress service. And as those change, things that are related will learn about that. So in fact, initially, you may not be able to exchange all the information you need to exchange because the other thing is waiting for something else. And so Juju will take care of essentially coming back to things that are related and saying, by the way, you can probably proceed now. Um, and it, it falls out very naturally when you're writing the charm, especially with the new reactive type framework, that your charm essentially just does what's needed is, and, and waits until it, it um, um, it's possible for it to proceed because other things in the network um, have kind of come into line. This is super useful when you're doing complex topologies like, like OpenStack, because you can imagine you're spinning all of those things up at the same time. They take different amounts of time to be ready effectively, and then you want that readiness to pro sort of propagate through the topology without you really having to worry about the macro state. Does that make sense? And I call this a new user safety zone. The first time I started using Juju and I saw the blog come up and I was like, wait a minute, how they do that? You know, you never actually manually put in where the IP addresses went. Uh, the Juju SSH, uh, application name slash, and then the number is the unit. So you could usually say my SQL slash zero, and we'll get into these details later. But you can use the Juju SSH command to go directly to the unit that's deploying. And then if you look in var log Juju, we have an entire log of what exactly is happening. And that, that in addition to the, the, the watch juju status that I told you, should kind of give you an understanding of what's happening underneath. Um, and we'll get into the details of here shortly about looking at status and what each of the statuses mean and exactly what things in that logs mean. But when I first started out, this was very useful for me um, because at first you don't, it, it just looks too magical, right? But we specifically, are looking at making things very observable for you so that at any time you can go to any one of those units and then find out exactly what's happening to see what's being passed over the wire for the relationships, for example. Okay, so you're 90% there. Uh, most, most of these commands, adding a unit, deploying and adding relation, will, or deploying a bundle, will give you 90% of the things that you need uh, with Juju. We have a bunch of bundles that are sitting in the charm store, so we can go to jujucharms.com, search for maybe your favorite thing, Redis, or something like that. We have a whole bunch of pre-made bundles for you. I've used the MediaWiki one as an example, but you can do big data, OpenStack, that sort of thing. This will get you mostly where you need to go. From there, we can do a lot more complicated things, like my database, I want to make sure you get deployed on a machine that has at least 32 cores, 64 gigs of RAM, and this kind of looking disk things like that. Or maybe you don't want to deploy to a specific machine. You want everything to be in a container and you want to specify this container on this machine on this cloud. Uh, so we'll get into those there. But what I've shown you here is basically for consuming Juju and trying it and just getting something up and running in the cloud uh, is, is, is what I've covered here today. You can follow this if you go to jujucharms.com, like I said before, and click on the get started link. And we have an example there for you to get up and running uh, while we get to the more advanced things. Did, did you have something to say? Oh, okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Can you dump and restore these models? I'm sorry, what? Can you dump and restore models? Can we dump and restore models? Yes. Yes, absolutely. The, the idea is, hey, I really like this cloud, but this other cloud came out and he says his cloud, cloud is faster and cheaper, right? What you want to do is you want to suck your model out, redeploy it on this new cloud, and then in the, in the benchmarks talk that we talked about, Juju has primitives to allow you to kind of measure performance in between the clouds so you can make better decisions and things like that. But that is yeah, what a bundle file is. Tease into, tease into yeah. that, that, that question, because it's actually a subtle question on many levels. 
one, one version of that is to say, can I take a representation of this topology with the config and the relations and give it to my buddy so that they can spin, spin up exactly the same thing maybe in their lab or in their cloud of choice, right? So that's what we would call a bundle. Mm -hmm. That's really a representation of how that thing was constructed at a high level, what services, what applications and relations and config, at a lower level, what size machines, how many machines, and the mapping to containers in those machines, right? And your bundle can be as rich or as shallow in that set as you like. That's kind of like a, a template, right, that you might share around. So yes, you can do that today. There's a deeper question, which is, since Juju models the individual units of the services, plus the disks, right, the stores attached to them, the EBS volumes or the Cinder volumes in OpenStack, we get getting to the point where you should actually be able to say transport this actual entire running topology with all of its data from this cloud to that cloud. And we're not there yet, but we will. I mean, essentially now we have a handle on everything in that cloud. We can shut down all of those things and literally copy the disks across and bring it up on another cloud. And then there's an in-between state, which is kind of interesting. Say I've got a controller, which is like the database, it's got the state server, it's got the model in it over here, right? What if, I, what if I'm running out of space there? The, you know, I've added models to this controller and now it's under load. I want to move some of those models off. Some of these models are growing. In Juju 2.0, one of the things we'll gain, and it's the first cut of this code, so it'll have bugs, um, is the ability to say, I want to, I want to actually live move this model to this controller. Now, it's all the same VMs in the model, or machines, or, or containers, or whatever it is out there that you're, that you're modeling this stuff on. But you essentially want to tell all of them to now listen to this controller instead of this controller. So that's kind of like a dump and restore of the live model d details. And the reason we've actually done that, one is for horizontally scalable. We effectively make Juju as a service infinitely horizontally scalable because as your controller gets full effectively, you just spin up another controller and you can keep adding models to more and more controllers effectively. But the bigger reason is upgrades. Because today, say I've got five models on this controller, I want to upgrade this controller and the database and everything. In one hit, I'm updating all of my operations for all of those models, and there's no way around that, right? Which is, which is as people do more and more serious stuff, that's more and more scary. So what we'll do is we'll say, okay, I'll deploy a newer version of the controller, right? And then I'll essentially do a model migration from here to here. That whole process is under control. I've never deleted the model here, and I haven't changed any code here either, right? So all of these machines will have a peek at this one and say, okay, do I think that's crazy over there, or do I think that's basically the same as what's going on over here? Because we're not changing the model, nothing should change if this guy, these guys are going to listen to this controller instead of this controller. This is a newer version, but the semantics should be the same as it of the model, because the model is unchanged. And if we're happy, all of the agents, all of the machines are going to be, going to be sane over here, we can then kill the model over here, effectively, and we've upgraded that model, we've moved it to a newer version of control. So you could move all the models across and then shut down those and get that get those machines back effectively. And that's how we'll do kind of call it aerospace upgrades, right? Because you're in flight and you're bolting on new engines um, to something that's pretty serious and in flight. Okay, so the future, I'm gonna skip this because Rick is gonna cover his 2.0 slide and we wanna to get to writing terms here real quick. Um, but yeah, no more mangling that environments.yaml. Sorry, you have to do that today. Um, thank you very much for coming. We're really looking forward to having a comprehensive track. As we said, and I mentioned in the, in the schedule, we've got workshops. If by today you, you are having a hard time launching anything, please come find me or anybody, um, or I can find someone to help you if you're having problems. So please don't suffer in silence. If you try something and it doesn't work, I'd be more than happy to sit down with you and help you.